Today is Monday, October 23rd, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. I'm here as always with my podcast partner, Mr. Wallace Smith. Mr. Smith, what do we have for our topic today? Well, for our third season, first episode of the third season, very excited about that, uh, we have a guest with us that we're going to talk about, uh, talk to, not talk about, that'd be awkward right in front of you. That'll be later. That'll be later. We'll talk to and uh, hear what he has to say. We appreciate that he's here visiting. Uh, in fact, it's a particular friend of the podcast. Uh, we'll just have him say hello first. Just Would you mind just here at the beginning saying hello to our hello. listeners? And I... I can't tell you how he thought, this is silly. They already know who I am because they probably read the title. Uh, but anyway, we're going to be talking to Mr. Phil Senna. So why don't you come right back right after the music. Hello, everyone. And again, welcome to the Living Youth Podcast. It's exciting being back on. It's uh, we, weren't, we were hoping to be on last time week and we were not able to be mr robinson was a bit under the weather and and so we thought well y'all you know y'all can do without us uh easily you have other things to do in your life uh but it is the first podcast after the feast and the first of the third season this is the 72nd one of these things yeah i can't believe we've done that many did you ever think mr robinson that you'd you'd ever have 71 podcasts under your belt no (laughs) yeah you know it's actually kind of interesting that mr senna is on today because the very first time in my life that the, even the topic of a podcast was broached and we'll probably disagree on all the details. So I'll try not to bring out a lot of details, but you, Mr. Senna called me, I was still in Missouri pastoring and uh, you had an idea for a youth podcast and, and you broached the topic with me. And I remember when I first brought, mentioned this, I said that you got, that you were listening to some other podcast, like click and clack or something. And you said, I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't listening to that. So my, my memory, but it was maybe a tech oriented, maybe it was a tech yes. oriented podcast. Okay. Yes. Uh, and so actually to, in a certain way, you're not just a friend of the podcast. You're, you're like the father of the mm. pod or maybe the, the grandfather of the mm. podcast. <laughs> grandfather. That's probably more appropriate. Yes. Uh, no, but uh, we know that you're here. We don't, we don't want to waste your time. We've probably wasted a lot of your time just hanging out and talking before we started recording the podcast. But let me say, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for being willing to take the time and do this with me and Mr. Robinson. Oh, I'm glad to be here, even though I'm here just for a short time here in Charlotte, uh, going back home uh, right after this podcast. But uh uh, glad to be here. Glad to do this. Oh, very glad to have you here. So what we wanted to do, and we've done this before, we like doing this when a, when a minister comes to visit, uh, a minister that maybe uh, people in the audience are teens and young adults who are listening may not know as well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we'd like to branch off, and we talked about this a bit before the podcast, from some of the things we have you talk about into some other things that you might want to take advantage of to to share with our younger audience. But we would like them to get to know you first, because I, it took me a while to realize this. I, the first time I ever talked with you, uh, it was, I think I was in Missouri. You were my in-laws pastor, mm-hmm. and, it, and we were just conversing because of that. And uh, then over time, got to meet you at the feast and spend time with you, and we've done Bible studies together. And But what I, you you actually uh, grew up in the church, right? Not not grow up, but you were younger when you yeah, came. Yeah, I was younger. My, okay. my mother, when I was around 12, um, my mother became interested in the church. Okay. She would see my father off to work every morning, and at that time, this was the early 70s, uh, at that time, Garner Ted Armstrong was the um, presenter on, what was it, Tomorrow's World? No, uh, the, world, the World Tomorrow. World Tomorrow. I, I get the two mixed up. Um, and uh, and so she became interested in that way. It was it was a daily program uh, during the week. And wow. so between the time she would see my father off to work and the time she would get us up for school, um, that's when she would watch it. And, uh, and so that's how she became interested. And so I was around... I was around 12 when we uh, started attending church. Um, before that, we were not religious in any way. So, um, Oh, really? No yeah. no particular religious nope. background? Nope, nothing. Fat, and you were 12? Yes, around 12. Yeah. Well, what what were your thoughts when she started getting interested in this Oh, I stuff? hated it. I, it was the last thing. <laughs> I remember the prevailing tone and what I heard while I was still in my bed and she played it pretty loud, (laughs) um, was just the end of the world. That's what it was. It just seemed like that's all he could talk about was the end of the world. And, um, when you're 12 years old, uh, it's the last thing you want to hear, you know? And I literally remember 
putting my head under the pillow because I didn't want to hear it. Really? And, and wow. It, I really didn't like it at all. And I was, I remember saying to myself, mom, please don't get into this, you know? And, uh, and, and so, yeah, that was my first impression of it. Did you have siblings? Did they react? Yeah, I had three older brothers and, uh, I don't know how they reacted as my mom got more and more into it. <clears throat> um, she started keeping the Sabbath. There was no congregation in our area at the time. Okay. This was in Northwestern Colorado. That's where I grew up. And, um, uh, she started keeping the Sabbath on her own. And, and the way she would do it was she would just spend all day in her room reading um, church material and the Bible okay. and things like that. <clears throat> and I would go in there every once in a while just to see what she was reading and everything. And um, years later, we found out that each one of us, uh, me and my brothers, would, without telling each other, go in and, and talk with her um, oh, while really? she was in there. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. And she she told us that later, years later, and the rest of us didn't know that we were each doing that. So wow. Was, yeah. But then um, eventually there started, there was a uh, congregation started in our area. And um, uh, I remember, really, I remember the day that I embraced it for myself. Um, I don't, yeah, I was going to ask because you are a minister in the church now and either we've really broadened our hiring, uh, practices <laughs> or else you did come to a point where you, you did embrace no, it. No, I did. And, and it was when I was still around that age, I don't know if it was when I was 12 or not, but it was around that time, definitely, a um, um, a teenager. Um, I remember sh she showed me and the thing is, is even though we didn't grow up religiously, uh, with any religious background, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible was the word of God. I believed in God too, even though I really didn't know who he was or anything. Um, and I remember that if she could show me in the Bible, you know, the things that she was saying was in there, if she could actually just show me in the Bible, then I would believe it. And I remember um, one day, and I remember this like it was yesterday, uh, she showed me a scripture, and I think it was in, in Matthew 24, um, where it was, it was, it's something about, you know, all of this was, that Jesus Christ was going to return and all of this was going to go away. And, um, and I remember, because she showed it to me in the Bible, and I was standing at our front picture window looking across the street at our neighbors' houses and and all that. This this was in a very small town in Colorado, around seventeen hundred people in the town. Oh, wow. And um, and I remember just looking over at the Zaner's house and the Doolin's house and and our front yard and the street in front of our yard and all of that, and thinking this is all going to be gone someday, hmm. and believing that because she showed it to me in the Bible, and um. And it changed my life from wow. that moment on, even though, you know, obviously I was still young and still, uh, you know, wanted to do things that young people want to do and everything. Um, I, from that moment on, I believed what I read in the Bible. And so if she could prove it to me in the Bible, then I believed it. And, uh, so, you know, so more and more, uh, things that she was learning, I would, I would learn to, um, and, uh, and so, you know, yeah, it, it, that's, that's basically the way it became mine. Well, that's neat. You know, you, you probably remember, maybe you've even given it since, but I, I do remember being at the, uh, Texas fee site. In fact, it was the same one. Mr. Robinson's told the story of having to make the, uh, the booth and mm, spearing, yes. spearing your hand with yes. something. What Ending was it? You wounded the, yourself. Uh, so much fun. <laughs> and then, uh, but that, that was that a good piece though. It, it, was. Oh, it was, it, it was, it was, I appreciate the, the work the you best. guys put into it. So you, you spoke there at that one mm -hmm. and I was going to actually steal your topic this last feast, but I didn't, I know you wouldn't mind if I did, but I ended up talking about something else being all in. Yes. Yeah. And I was going to, I was going to say that, that what you talk about there, it, it make, I was, I was going to turn that back and ask, was it about that time that you decided to be all in, you know, or were yes. you, you, you all 10 toes, so to speak? Yeah, really. I mean, it, it really was the moment where I broke away from what the orientation of my life before, mm. which was all about my town, my friends, my bike, you know, my, you know, the, it, everything in, in my world there. And what was interesting was uh, 
my vision started going into eternity rather mm. than just the here and now. And that opened up my my mind to the possibilities of eternal life and, and uh, tomorrow's world and all that. And so my friends, though, were still where they were, you know, the, where, where I was before that, um, just focused on the things of their lives and, and the here and now and all of that. Whereas my mind was now shifted to, you know, much, much higher hmm. vision. And, um, and from that point on, I kind of broke away from my friends and what they were doing and just being with them. And uh, friends in the church became my, my friends. And even though we didn't have uh, a big congregation or anything like that, we, we went to every, you know, YOU, which is the youth, uh, program. youth program at the time, um, event that there was in the area. And I'm so thankful that our parents were uh, so accommodating in doing that. We'd go to Denver, we'd go to Grand Junction, you know, we'd go to and take advantage of all these opportunities with other kids our age. And they became my friends. They became my focus. And, and the church, I totally embraced it at that time. To where, by the time I was in in high school, um, my goal was to go to Ambassador College. Okay, I was going to ask about that. What, yeah. what 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 was your thinking there? Oh, yeah, that's that's all I wanted to do was to go to Ambassador College once because I wanted to be because I was so um, into this this um, way of life and learning more about God in this context. Um, what better place to do that was yeah. than was there? And also, you know, just being with more young people my age. And uh, so this was, I graduated high school in 1980 uh, and uh, went to college, went to Ambassador College in 81. And uh, so that was a long time ago. You yeah. were probably very young. I then. tend to, I tend to forget the exact age difference between you and me. And now that you've mentioned that, I realize it's like 30, 35 years. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> exaggeration. I graduated in 88. So it's, uh, yes. was that a good, eight, good eight years. Yeah. I can't believe I'm six. I'm in my sixties now. So yeah. <laughs> oh, you look so young and spry. Yeah. Though, I feel uh, so young. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Mr. Robinson, uh, Mr. Senna, became your pastor around when when but when was that okay i can i can probably think this through i can tell you okay that, that'd be sure it was a year that would live in infamy uh, 2005 was the year we moved to okay. oh. austin it, and you know what's funny is um i had never i don't think i'd ever heard your name like i mean i didn't know who you were a lot of times you tend to have heard of, of the ministry and you came in from florida right that was mm -hmm. your first assignment yes. but but i would like to hear briefly a little bit about your time period between um, ambassador college and when you went into the full-time ministry, because mm -hmm. that's early on one of the ways you and I bonded, we had some shared, that's right. Well, it wasn't exactly shared work experiences, but there was some natural overlap in things that we oh, did. Oh yeah. Yeah. You were in the printing and one of the jobs that I had before I was in the ministry was working in publishing for the organization that ran the good Sam club. And that was in Ventura, California. And, um, I was married by then before kids and, uh, our goal after we got married was to eventually move back to Colorado. This we we were still living in California then, but I got this job at 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 this uh, at this publishing um, that we published like five to seven magazines, uh, and I was working in the production area, um, mostly using Quark Express, which was the the big page layout program at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, <clears throat> their headquarters was in Denver. So I worked at this place for a couple of years, parlayed that into my experience there into getting a job at Cork in Denver. And that's how we, we ended up back in Colorado. That's where we, that's when the global living split happened after we got there mm. in 98. And then um, because of that split, all the leadership that was in the global church in the Denver area went elsewhere. And there basically there was, there was no leadership like a void. for yeah, yeah. the void. And, and we just picked up the slack and found a place to meet and I wasn't ordained or anything. And, uh, and so, um, that's, that's basically, you know, God had plans and, right. um, brought uh, us there for that area. A, a lot of, I've noticed a lot of careers in the church started like that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cause so what ours was some people had left our areas and there was nobody left but me and my brother-in-law, Sean, and we would we just naturally started doing the setup and the sound and things like that. Yeah, you fill in the gap, and the and the thing is, is you never know how these things play into the overall big picture. 
of your life and and right. what God is doing. But I I completely believe that you know the timing and where we were <clears throat> where we were brought and everything was for that purpose. And um, you know it, uh, you know I think that's one of the things that <clears throat> that has been a um, uh, a theme that that all of us can see in our own lives, but I've seen it in my own life where, you know, these, these, you have these experiences and you don't know how they fit together into, mm. you know, your overall life and how you're going to use those and everything, but they always do. And, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, all the preparation I had before that, uh, led to that. And then, you know, my going to ambassador college, you know, obviously, well, it was a good foundation for being in the ministry and everything. And, and then, you know, just the, the work experience and all of that. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it all fits together. That's where we had our overlap because I worked in, as more print than publishing, but I, I used Cork Express extensively yes. and uh, loved it. And, uh, you, you know, we can't, we can't digress too far here on the podcast because you don't have the time, but you talk about a company that fell for its own hubris. And, and <laughs> suffered really? greatly. Oh yeah, they. I mean, yeah, we can't get into it. But they no. were they were eventually run over by Adobe when Adobe started bundling and design with Photoshop, and that was kind of the beginning of the end. Well, Tomorrow's World was laid out in Cork Express for a, yeah, long, for a time, long time, right? Oh, yeah. And, and, and yeah. every magazine it. of worth was. Yeah. I mean, it was the wow. king. It wow. definitely was the king. So I've told some of these stories before on the podcast. But so at 2005, Mr. Senna breezes into town, and he. Uh, I didn't know it so much at the time, but I feel like pretty quickly you went around trying to evaluate who you had in the areas and like, you know, potential and maybe, maybe look at things organizationally that you, you might change or might not. And so I remember that I can't remember, I can't remember what we were working on, but we met at my print shop on a Sunday and we were working together working on the feast brochure. Was it the feast? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, again, little did I know that I kind of, I kind of had a sense of it and I, I th- felt like I, I Felt like Mr. Senna was kind of testing kick, the kicking waters, the tires, yeah, kicking the tires right? <laughs> and then, uh, and then the next thing I know, my my brother-in-law Sean Dumas said, "Hey, have you seen the speaking schedule?" Because I had never given a sermon. I mean, I was on the schedule because I would do song leading, right? But I didn't speak. I'd never spoken. I, I genuinely thought that I would live and die my entire life having never ever given a sermon at. And uh, and there I was on the speaking list <laughs> to, to give a sermonette. And but the two things I liked about it was one, I kind of liked it that Mr. Senna just put me on and didn't ask. If I wanted to do it. We're not encouraging others to do that. But yeah. <laughs> I don't Actually, I, I I've heard you say that on the podcast, and I can't believe I did that. I I I would never do that now. I would always yeah. talk to the person before. Well, for what it's worth, I loved it. Maybe God knew what you needed, Mr. Yeah, Robinson. Yeah, exactly. So he made sure it happened that way. My thought was, it was it really was probably better for me that way. My thought was at first, of course, naturally some panic, but then it was. <laughs> No, I I should be able to do this because I mm. think I was in, in my early thirties, maybe two thousand five. Yeah, and uh, and so and so what I loved about it, this is kind of why I brought it up, is you, know, you talk about God working things out. Mm-hmm. Like you were the perfect guy for me, the perfect fit for me to help me get started speaking and, and train me in, in the right way, and it, it's really stood me in good stead because I felt like I put you know you. There, there were already solid basic principles for speaking, and you just emphasized them. And since I didn't have anything to unlearn, it was generally easy for me to just learn the new stuff the right way. And after about twenty or thirty sermonettes, you know, kind of had the formula down. And it, it, the hardest thing about a sermonette at first is getting it small enough. Yes, I remember you. You would say to us what Mister Mister Thompson would say, yes. guys. It's still too much, you too know, broad. That sermonette. <laughs> too broad, guys. So what's funny is when you brought in the. Uh, when you started having everybody in the in your so in Houston, Austin, Temple, San Antonio, everybody would give the same sermonette. Yeah, and they were assigned, which I didn't mind that at all. Some didn't take it as well. Right. But uh, I found what's interesting is if if I could read the title of the sermonette, like what what it's supposed to be, and I could say no or yes, like it feels. How can I do a sermonette on this? It feels like it's a one word answer. Those often were actually some of the best ones because. They were just simple, and I thought mm. I feel like they really benefited the congregations. Some of those topics we hit. Yeah, well, all of that was based on my own experience giving sermonettes and everything. And I remember one the, I mean, I went through Ambassador College, went through homiletics, had all that training there, and I still gave really bad sermonettes because they were too too much. Mm. There, I was basically shoehorning 
uh, sermon topics or Bible study topics into a sermonette, and that just doesn't work. But the thing that helped me the most is something that I implement even to this day uh, because it helped me the most to um, really uh, hone those down was to have the three-verse limit. And I don't mean three passages. I mean three verses, single verses. That's it. Um, and that really helps discipline yes. um, yep. and focus the message. Yep. And I, it, th- I think it really is the most of, most helpful thing for me. And that's why I, I implemented it. And I still implement it because, um, because I know it works. Well, I completely agree because at first, at first I was like, You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. You know? And that's what I thought, too, when I first started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I came I came by the conclusion, honestly, because I started off thinking there's no way that's going to work. And then later I'm like, that's the only way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it helps. That's for sure. You know, I in in my area, Missouri, I, I took the, the we you and I talked about these things you're doing. Yes. And I remember thinking, man, he's he's only letting these guys do three verses. What the what a mm-hmm. what a dictator, you know, just <laughs> a but I so when I put together my uh sermonette manual for my local area and we'd had like a workshop while the guys from the area we came in and, and we kind of spent a day and got food brought in and i mentioned that you know for a time you know we might do this i know it seems more restrictive but that's because it is and i even encourage them here and there that to challenge them at least once in their life to just pick one verse but really expound on it and really <clears throat> teach about it yeah. and it was so beneficial and it reminds me of something i uh, who I can't remember. I can't remember who it was who said it, and I've actually seen it more than once. So whoever heard said it is irrelevant. But reminds me of something about when it comes to creatives. They said that it, that you, people do worse work when they have fewer restrictions. That mm-hmm. you get the best work out of creative people. Almost the more restrictions they have, I'm sure that there's a limit to it. And they actually gave us example recently, uh, James Cameron and the Avatar movies. Mm. They said that when he had to be pressed to really achieve, and he was didn't it wasn't it was not limitless resources. He made better movies. In this last one, they said, yeah, he just essentially they're just giving him all the money he could ever want, and the result is visually spectacular. But they said story wise, it's just there's just not much there. And uh, I had to pick on. Uh, say George Lucas, but I, I, I think I saw that with George Lucas as well. In the earliest days in the seventies, he had to earn his way. And as a result, you're really having to, rest- you're, 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 you've got a tight budget, you've got to work hard, but it presses you to do a lot of good thinking. And then you get into the the nineties and the early two thousands. And you know, you, if, if they, if he's taking a shower, they want it to be money coming out that he could possibly turn into more money for them. So it's limitless control. And the result is, is, I mean, I'm not trying to knock it for the big fans out there. I'm, you know, someone a fan too, but still, uh, inferior product, you know, and that when it comes to even poetry is essentially an artificial restriction on what you're saying that tends to bring out different qualities. And it's it's contradictory out there. But if you have young people who are trying to be creative, I would encourage you to not not think you need more. Oh, mom and dad, if I only had this many color pencils and this and that, I would think to try to do as much as you can with what you have. Before we move on to some other things, and I know that you, you came with some thoughts in mind, Mr. Sen. I want to go back and just highlight something you said that you were you know, 12 or so when all this was starting and you were still in that age range when you really started to take it seriously, when you started to see these things really are in the Bible and therefore they're real. I just want to remind all of our listeners, because again, with teens and young adults, we have some listening as, as young as 13, you know, as old as in their early twenties, but, and, and, you know, families that sit down and listen together, but just concerning Mr. Senna's example, you don't have to wait. It's easy to wait to think, well, you know, the time to be serious about all this is when I'm older. But I mean, the truths are true, whether you're young or old and the promises of God are rich and exciting, whether you're young or old. And I remember, I think I've told the story before. I can't recall. But when I learned about the church myself, it was from someone who I remember asking her when I was first starting to, to, to really think about this church. Cause she, I was, I, cause I was baptized. I got baptized, dunked in water, quote unquote, when I was about 13 or so, it wasn't in the church of God. It was where I was going then. And I remember her just saying, my friend who happened to be in the church, say something like, oh yeah, people in our church are way older when they're baptized. All I knew was, oh, well, I wonder how old that is. I don't really know. And then when I was, I attended my first Sabbath service, I was driving back with another guy and he'd been attending a whole two weeks before me. So in my mind, he was the expert. He, he probably already knew so much more than I did. And I asked him, 
uh, hey, I, because I, I, I was 18 then. I was already, I was thinking this. I just left everything I have. I, w- I want to take this seriously. I, I heard people are older when they're baptized in this church. How much older are they? And he very sincerely, he, he, he didn't know any better either. But son, your sons are too young to say, I don't know. And you really learned to learn to say that. And he said, oh, I think you got to be like in your 30s or something. <laughs> and she's probably saying that because some people are called from the world, you know, and they're baptized mm-hmm. later. But I started to rationalize in my head. And then we're dumb too. Instead of actually verifying answers, we just start to justify them. And I think, Oh, we know, I guess, you know, Jesus was 30, you know, or so when he started his ministry and, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to that. And well, it wasn't until I actually met someone who was baptized and they were 19. I realized, okay, I'm an idiot. You know, I should have looked into this more, but at the same time, all of you listening, if you're listening to this and you're a younger person, then you, you don't, then you, you know better, right? I mean, you can take this stuff seriously right now. There's promises that are out there for you and acts when, when uh, Peter says to repent, he says the promises are for you and for your children and all those who are afar off. So uh, anyway, I just want to encourage you: be, be Mr. Senna, uh, <laughs> you, you people, and 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 be open to taking all of this seriously from the beginning. And it, it really, you don't have to wait to have your life transformed and and for things to look different around you. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to take it serious as early as possible. Yeah, I think if you uh, if you understand it and um, for yourself, yeah. uh, God's working with you, and yeah. um, and it doesn't matter what the age is. Um, now, of, of course, I was still a teenager. I didn't get baptized until I was twenty one. So um, it was it was you know there was still I was still you know. Eh, Doing what teenagers do, you know, right? <clears throat> but my mindset, my my focus, my my worldview was totally different uh, from right. that point forward. So. Yeah, I'm definitely not saying if you're 13, go ask your mom, and dad to be baptized right. yet, you know. But yeah, but start taking it seriously because by the time you did arrive there at that time, it was it was kind of a natural progression. You've yep. been growing and been learning. Yes. Uh, well, one of the things we wanted to talk about today, and you mentioned this on the phone when we talked about you you being on the program, is you know, we're living in serious times, clearly. Uh, you, we've got war raging in, in Europe. We've got war now raging in, in, in Israel, oh, next to Israel there in the Middle East. Um, and you believe you had some perspective that you could share, which we'd really appreciate in terms of what it means to be young and in the church, but then hearing news like this, because yeah. this, this isn't the last thing we're going to hear in terms of big news in the world. There's surely larger things coming. Th- things ebb and flow but we know there will be large things. And so, yeah, however you'd like to launch into talking about that, I appreciate it. Well, I remember having that perspective. Remember I was talking about um, standing at the picture window and reading a scripture about the world coming to an end. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was one of the, it was the message, it was the main message that I thought the church was talking about, or at least Garner Ted Armstrong was talking about on the telecast. And um, I resisted it, didn't want to hear it and all that. <laughs> um, but until I read it in God's word, then I, I, I believed it. Right. Um, but then what do you do with that? You know, as a teenager, as a, as a young person, um, because this was the seventies, early seventies. And, and um, if you're not familiar with the, the tone of the world in the seventies, mm. um, especially in the Carter administration in the United States. Um, it, and we had like a, uh, oil embargoes and um i remember watching the news and there were like gas line lines for gas uh at gas stations that just reached miles and miles and miles yeah we couldn't go we had to we were restricted on what days we were even allowed to get gas exactly based on your license plate i remember that yeah i remember that um and um there was there were um wars and rumors of wars and and all of that and things looked bleak then i remember thinking thinking that, okay, my mother was baptized and she would be in the first resurrection, but time would not go on long enough for me to be baptized, you know, um, because things looked very bleak then. I mean, they looked like it could come. And of course that was uh, a predominant idea and thought in the church as well. You know, we always talked about the soon coming kingdom of God and, depending on when, when that is for you, I mean, soon coming can mean tomorrow. Um, but it also in God's perspective, it could be, you know, many decades. Uh, and I've just come to see, and through all of these different things, and I've been baptized now for over 40 years and, 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 and seeing things and seeing how people react to things, people in the church react to things that look like major, 
um, issues, and they are, um, but they may not be the catalyst to um, exactly uh, everything prophetic coming together, the end times. Um, and so how, how do you approach those things as a young person? And I had to deal with that myself um, and throughout you know all the decades since then. One of the things that has helped me to deal with when things seem to be overwhelming on the world scene or even personally in your personal life and you feel like, wow, I don't know if I can handle this, Hmm. um, is just, I use the analogy of, of following God is like water skiing, (laughs) (laughs) which sounds like a funny thing to say, but it's like this. Um, if you've ever water skied and I've only done it a few times, um, one of the keys to water skiing, getting up on the skis and actually mm-hmm. skiing, um, is keeping your knees bent while you're skiing, but also keeping a hold of the rope or the, okay. you know, you're, where you're tethered to the, the, the boat. Um, and water skiing, um, like that, or any even snow skiing is like this too, where you you keep your knees bent because it absorbs the shocks of, mm. because waves are going to come and things are going to happen, and you've got to be ready for whatever happens and and be uh, kind of in the in the posture um, to where you can absorb the shocks. Uh, right, because it's not like a perfectly smooth surface. Exactly, it's, it's exactly. water, but it's, yeah. it's ripply, and you got the wake, and you got all yeah. sorts. And of the things. thing is, is once you once you straighten your legs out, then you can't absorb the shocks. And so, mm. you, the one thing you want to do is to always keep your knees bent to absorb the shocks, whatever whatever happens. Um, and following God is like that. I mean, because there are all sorts of things that happen in following God, and if you get too um, even with people who come up with the scenarios of figuring out the timeline or figuring out dates or trying or really focused on end times and figuring out exactly when things are going to happen, that's like straightening your legs um, instead of keeping your knees bent. That's becoming too rigid. It, rigid is, is, okay. is a good word there. Because um, you've got to be able to be flexible and because there are times when things look like, man, this is it. This is really going to happen. I remember, you know, even the, uh, financial crisis in 2008, Mm -hmm. um, it looked very, very serious then. But you know, one of the things that, that was interesting at that time was, um, I had a relationship with Mr. Meredith at the time, you know, and that was, that was very, very helpful during times like that, because while I was personally inside myself, um, kind of wondering, uh, you know, is this it? Um, I talked to him about that mm. and he's, he's saying, no, this isn't it because you know, mm. this has got to happen. This has got to happen. Europe's got to do this and all that kind of stuff. And it really settled me and helped me to understand, oh yeah, there are all these other things that need to be in place and all that. So, um, I felt, and, and this was when I was a pastor in Austin, um, I felt, um, stay the course uh, you know, because, because I'm sure people are looking to the ministry for guidance and, and direction as to how to handle these things. And me being able to go to him to mm. ask these things really settled me to where I could, I could be a, a good, good help to the a to resource the for others. Exactly. Yeah. Um, mm. and, and that's, I think that's one of the most important things that I've learned too, through all things like this is keep your eyes at headquarters Keep your eyes on who God is working with and through um, because he's always done this where he's used leadership like with Moses, with the Israelites and everything. He was their, he was their clear chosen leader. He was his clear chosen leader. Um, And, and he was through whom he was directing his people. Um, and it's the same today. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's even, is very helpful for even young people now. You may, you may be a teenager and wondering for yourself, um, you know, is, it, is this it? You see the, the, um, the trouble in the Middle East, and, and, and um, I'm not saying that it can't be a catalyst for sure. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But um, one, of the, one of the keys to being settled 
in things like this is really be plugged into headquarters because God works through his, his mm. servants. Um, in fact, what's the scripture that we were looking at earlier? Yeah, it's we, Amos, Amos 3, 7. Yeah, Amos 3, 7. Yeah. It down, right. Yeah, where it says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Um, and that's a, that's a constant theme throughout the, the Bible, and it remains to this day. Um, if we believe that this is where God is working, and I do, um, well, he's going to use those, those leaders to, and I mean the, you know, the, the leadership uh, to guide his people through these things. Um, and so as young people, as I had to do in, in my time, um, be plugged into what Mr. Weston's saying. Back in my day, it was Mr. Armstrong. Read what he was writing uh, listen to his sermons and not only his, but you know, um, the, the articles that, well, even, even a few months ago, Mr. Ames had a, a, a sermon that was posted on, on our, um, uh, YouTube and, and podcast, uh, watch the Middle East. Um, yeah. the, you know, things like that. I mean, th- those really are helpful in grounding us and giving us um, peace of mind and knowing that we'll be taken care of, you know, uh, there's also the, the aspect of, you know, we got to be living righteously as well. You know, if we're sinning, if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, well, you know, that's, that's, that doesn't give you confidence that, that God will be with you. Um, and so those types of things too. So it's, you know, it's, it's what you do personally, but it's also where your eyes are focused too. So I, you know, yeah. because if you, if you listen to CNN, listen to Fox news and, and everyone on the internet, you're only going to get confused because they'll come up with their own ideas and everything. Um, God is consistent in how he works with, uh, leading his people. And I think that's a very, very important, it's been a major key for my endurance, um, through the things I've been through. Yeah. It's really interesting. You, you, you say that because that we, we live in an age where we we're inundated with so much quote unquote information. We even had to coin the idea of misinformation, you know, mm-hmm. which of course misinformation has been around forever, but, but, Honestly, that's part of why I wrote the credibility crisis article, because we're at a stage where you hear so much, you don't even know what to, what to trust. And some of us can be tempted, even young individuals. I've talked to some in their, uh, literally in their early twenties who are, just, are, are trying to, they're plugged into a lot of YouTube channels. They're plugged into, and they're really soaking it up. And to a certain extent, I, that is what the world has to say that now the analysts, the commentators, podcasts, and to a certain extent, I'm sympathetic. I remember when I had kind of a, political awakening. If you, I didn't become political. I was already in the church, but the first time I really started queuing in on politics and paying attention at a different level, I'll say was actually after I was already married in the church, it was around the time of the, uh, the Bush Gore controversy in terms of who won the presidential election. And so it's not that I wasn't paying attention to news and definitely trying to keep up with problems, but suddenly it was just more riveting. It just grabbed my attention in a different way. And I actually discovered I was taking in too much news and I was, I, how did I knew that was some months later and I read a commentary in the wall street journal and I started, I was agreeing with the guy in my head. I remember thinking, yeah, you know, that's right. You know, it's, but then thankfully maybe it was, whether it was God in his spirit, I certainly appreciate it. It hit me. Wait a minute. I'm agreeing with this guy. And yet I can actually name a scripture that disagrees with this guy. This is not actually his point is not the Bible's point. And all the more these days, we can invest so much time very easily. We subscribe to it. Our Twitter feeds are unending. And yet, all those people are in confusion. We tend to think of this in terms of science. Like you have to put, um, don't ignore revelation. Not the book, uh, the book revelation. Of course, that too. But God's revelation that people, the scientists are always trying to interpret the entire world and the physical evidence around them. But they don't put revelation first. They don't put what God says about the world first and therefore all of their conclusions are off. Mm-hmm. They do, they have, they, they miss that missing ingredient. And what I, what I hear you saying, if I'm to paraphrase what you're saying is that you can do exactly the same in when it comes to world events and what's happening around us right now that we hear about on the news, we can, we can accidentally not tune in to what God would reveal about these things. And he would do that through his church if he's going to do it anywhere 
Um, and then all we do is we listen to the cacophony of all the commentators and talking heads out there when really, if God is going to provide any kind of insight, we should not expect that out of the mouth of a Fox news anchor or a CNN anchor. It's not that what they're saying is necessarily going to be false, but it's not going to have that ingredient. And the Bible tells us that if God is working in the world and if he's not working behind it, we don't even care about it as much. If he's going to be working through the world, he's going to reveal what he's doing through his servants. And so that, that should be something we focus on. We should seek to want to know what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's one of the wonderful privileges of being called by God is that we, we should not overlook the obvious in that God is working and always has worked through his people, um, his leadership, and then through the leadership to the people. Uh, his people, his chosen people, and that we're not groping in the dark. We're not, we're not out there, you know, just wondering and, and grasping at, at, at whatever. Um, but we're all, but it also settles us. And that's mm. very important as a young person, because I remember there were times, um, when I, as, as most teenagers do, you go through your teenage angst and you go through your, um, uh, wondering about life and, and the world and your place in it and all those kinds of things. And I think that's natural to a certain extent, but it can be, and especially now with, uh, uh, social media, the way it mm -hmm. is. Um, it, it, and I think Satan has a big part in doing, in doing this. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's all that much harder now. Yeah. And this is, this is where being settled by the word of God and, by his servants um, can really, really help us to be settled and to be have quietness and confidence that if I do what I'm supposed to do, God will take care of me. You know, something you said reminds me, I think it's Mr. Weston who said this, because when I, when I was growing up, uh, you were already a full mature man. Yes, I was. Yeah. Well, I remember... Russia versus the U.S. was the big deal. It's what we, what we all expected was Russia was going to nuke us, or we were going to nuke. We're going to have to nuke them. Whatever that we were expecting, the Cold War to turn into a hot war. All the all the movie movies coming out were you know the U.S. versus in the communist and Arnold Schwarzenegger playing a Russian and Jim Belushi, I think it was that one. They started together. That date me a little bit, but. Uh, anyway, that that was the thing, and I remember drawing pictures. I say it in TWPs. I remember drawing a Russian tank coming from one because i'm a boy right and an american tank come from the other side and i draw them like they're about to like collide which is stupid that's not good tank warfare but still i do a russian flag on one or soviet union flag i should say and a american flag on the other and i remember thinking myself well okay i live close to dallas and dallas has defense contracts and stuff so well yeah i'll probably die in a early in a blast so you're thinking those things but you know who wasn't worried about that to the same degree as if i, if I recall he's the one that said this was gerald weston mm -hmm. mr weston was not as worried because he looked in prophecy and prophecy did not indicate this massive russian you know american nuclear war and and he had a peace of mind that yeah. I didn't have because he he was older, sure, but but the thing is those truths were still in the Bible even though I was younger. And nothing against my parents, God had not called them, but if if they had had that, they 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 could have helped. I would have known. And so that's what you're saying is the, the Bible can give us a perspective on these things, so that even even though we're younger and it might think, man, the future seems so messed up, we don't we don't have to worry about those things. We we have a, a source of comfort that we're blessed with that other people don't have. Oh, it's such a blessing to have that truth. Yeah. Well, wow. You've, you've been on for more than 40 minutes now. I know you wanted something quick, so, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to use up our Phil Senna quota, uh, too early. We might want to talk to you later in the year. If you're ever here, I still want to remain a friend of the show. Do you? Yeah, well, I do. I, 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 we need I, to come up with some real. I'm things. changing my name, my first name, to friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get those business cards printed. Okay. printed for yeah. you. Yeah. Was there anything else, Miss Robinson? Do you have anything else to nope. to bother Mr. Senna with? No, nope. I do no. not. No. They, it, they can't hear me shaking my head out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Well, thank you, Mr. Senna, for taking the time with us. I mean, we really, really do appreciate it. We, we were hoping that during the few times you're in town uh, that you'd be able to do this. And so, and, hey, if you know you're coming again, let us know. We'd love to. The, the show 
would always like to have a friend. And yeah. uh, we appreciate, I appreciate that. it. It's, a, it's always fun to join you guys and to see you again. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Uh, take care. All right. All right.